it's with that, with that ancestral wisdom, with the honoring of who we are presently, and most importantly, the ancestors, ancestors that we also represent, that I would like to present to you Dr. Anthony Pico. And Anthony Pico, um, Dr. Anthony Pico, was a person that was really instrumental in the first and historic um, intertribal inter um, gathering of um, nations, um, I believe about a year ago, at the Gila River River, at the Gila River Indian Reservation, where this historic conference called the, um, Calling the Warrior Spirit Within gathered together. And the mission is to really um, put into action Crazy Horse's prophecy of the seven generations. And so in this prophecy and in this mission is to really create the, the cre creating like the reservation model into a trauma-informed reservation community as well. So with these words, I would like to invite Dr. Pico to the stage. I asked Sophia to hang around a little bit because I'm going to talk about her. Um, during my presentation this afternoon, I'm going to mention several times my uncle, the Honorable Thomas James Hyde. My Uncle Tom, uh, he was my champion. He was my rock. He loved me more than any other man I ever knew. Three days before his 92nd birthday, on Thursday, he died. And Saturday, on his birthday, we were doing funeral arrangements for him. So it's been a difficult few days. A cousin at the reservation asked me, are you still going to LA? I told him, if I don't go, my uncle's gonna haunt me. <laughs> Thank you. And I would like to take this time to introduce a very close friend of mine. He and I were involved in the gaming wars in the year before, 19, before the year 2000. Um, I would like to introduce um, the Honorable Marshall McKay, former chairman of the Nochadihi Winton Nation. Marshall. <laughs> Marshall astutely took his people from poverty to a place to where they can make choices today. So anyway, good afternoon. And I finally got here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I'm humbled and I'm excited uh, to have this opportunity um, because of our warrior spirit and indigenous wisdom that are at the forefront um, of healing our trauma, the trauma that has been on the red man's trail for over 500 years. Our confidence is so high that we believe in two generations we will disable historical trauma in the Native American communities here in Southern California, our homeland. Today, we are making a spiritual connection with the purpose of helping relieve the suffering of our Indian and non-Indian brothers and sisters. I have met so many people uh, who are part of the childhood trauma movement uh, that are so compassionate and so generous, hardworking, dedicated, uh, people with so much empathy. Works here. There we go, we got it, okay. This is only the second time I've ever done a PowerPoint. <laughs> the first time I heard of ECHO uh, was last year in April at the first Warrior Spirit Conference of the Gila River Indian Community um, near the town of Sacaton, Arizona. There was this lady that was there, Sofia Teladoro, uh, with a Latina accent. Um, it was thicker then. <laughs> Or California influence, <laughs> yeah. who sat at the table in front of me, who asked more questions than anyone else. But in brief conversations with her, I was very impressed, not only with the questions that she asked, but her knowledge of ACEs. Uh, we met again at the second Warrior Spirit Conference uh, and ceremony at the Viejas Indian Reservation in early October, and she approached me with an interest to have me present here today. Um, she had given me her card, so I want to see, I went online, but I, I'm computer illiterate. And so, but I did have a phone that, um, where I learned uh, 
who you folks are. I've been learning about that. So after looking at your website, I could understand why Ms. Teodoro is so informed. Um, when I read your physical impact of trauma and the fact that you embrace evidence-based healing modalities steeped in science, um, it increased my confidence that indigenous wisdom and our warrior spirit approach are crucial so that Western medicine and Native American traditional healing practices will give our people such an understanding and significantly increase options on how to heal. We'll share what we understand about our Native American traditional healing practices with you and anyone who wants to know, as we are all in that same boat, so to speak. I'm so impressed, beginning to understand what you do and offer within your ECHO training. I was curious as to who your leader is. I know when something really looks good, you gotta look who the leader is. And, um, and uh, I learned that it's Miss Louise Godbold, and I learned that she's one of the most passionate, empathetic, visionary leaders in her region. And passion and empathy, empathy are qualities of indigenous wisdom. Her scientific approach is exactly what we need uh, when, you come, when you come forth with resolutions. And the, the physical impacts uh, approach and the resolutions of your training at ECHO, you guys cover things like brain architecture, brain waves, neurotransmitters, immune system, toxin elimination, hormones, nervous system, and understanding the cellular change that goes on, providing how we can heal. Um, neural pathways. I want to add to the neural pathways. I'm not too familiar with that, but I do know this, is that if one can say how they feel to another human being, um, whether it's a spouse or a good friend, friend a clergy, a uh, medicine woman or a medicine man or therapist is so important to this rewiring. Native America is highly interested in your approach. And we believe that blending Western med medical medicine and traditional healing practices is critical for us. Believe your Western medical modalities and our traditional healing approach, which is rooted in spirituality, love, and probably from your perspective, faith, it is not faith to us. Western medicine and traditional healing are equally relevant and from our perspective needs to be combined to provide the true holistic healing for native populations. I'm going to have a three minute video that um, we learn more about historical trauma and cultural trauma uh, and about Native Americans in California. So let's see if we can get it going here. Nope. There it goes. All right. You could get as much as $5 for a head or a scalp of an Indian. Now, the average wage was 25 cents a day. Imagine how much you could get by turning in an Indian head or a scalp. Five dollars. That's a lot of money. There was people that turned to Indian hunters. The government put together militias that sole purpose was to go throughout California and do nothing but slaughter and the law, that act, the government and protection of Native Americans in California, allowed all that stuff to happen. You could not testify that somebody did something to you or killed your wife or raped your wife or anything. Therefore, no charges were ever brought. It was legalized and subsidized extermination of the Indians all the way across California. At the end, the federal government paid California back for all those bounties that they paid out. It was over a million dollars, along with the killing of Indians, also brought disease, smallpox being the main one large 
portions of villages would just die off because we had no immunity to it, so we had no way to fight it. The other thing that created problems was starvation, that the elk herd disappeared. The white people ate them. Well, same for the deer and the antelope and all the food. But to give you an idea of how fast this occurred, at the beginning of the gold rush, we had in our territory just here, over 7,000 Indians here. Two years after the gold rush started, we were down to 3,500. A year after that, we're down to 2,500. By the 1905 and 1906 census, our population was 53. By the 1934, the Indian Reorganization Act, 18 people. So, that's how fast our population dropped. I want it to be known that we're still here. We never left our homelands, and this is where our people will always be. The biggest genocide in human history didn't happen in Nazi Germany, uh, but on American soil. Over 100 Native Americans uh, were slaughtered or died by disease. The photo on the right is uh, the Na uh, Native American boarding school, which I'll talk about a little bit later in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. I want to make this clear. Nothing that I'm saying is meant to demean or embarrass you. People of today are not responsible for the actions of others who came before you or the world that you and your parents were born into. All of us are responsible for understanding, educating ourselves, and stopping the pain caused by ignorance, racism, class warfare, and capitalist greed. Rooted in the American economic, intellectual, government, and social systems are untruths that keep us provided Keep us divided as slaves in a feudal society that may not be responsible directly for the past. We are all, however, responsible directly for the past. We are not responsible for the past. We are all, however, responsible for a more just and future of all people. Within my presentation, I'm going to uh, use some words that I would like to define for you before I begin. And some of them you may uh, have heard of others are new uh, to the definition or new as a way of Native Americans understand. So I'll define warrior. I'll define warrior spirit, indigenous wisdom, which is the foundation of Native American healing, colonization, historical trauma, cultural trauma, intergenerational trauma, and present trauma, which you all know as childhood trauma. Cultural trauma is an attack on the fabric of Native American society affecting the essence and functioning of our community and tribal citizens. One of the most devastating was the government boarding schools where children were taken from their parents and assimilated into white society. My mother was a victim of boarding school. She told me, she said, we were always hungry and always cold. Our hair was cut, we were dressed in uniforms, we were speaking, punished for speaking our own language. Our future authentic selves were taken from us. Many died from loneliness. Many died from loneliness. Can you imagine what happens to a child physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually when a child dies from loneliness? It must be a slow, agonizing death. The child dies with no friends and no advocates, no one to kiss them goodnight. I can imagine what they went through night after night. I am nobody's darling. Nobody cares for me. Then the heart stops. This has and continues to haunt me. This next clip is about um, epigenetics, um, international trauma, intergenerational trauma, under, understanding natives inherited pain. 
I'm glad somebody finally came up with this, inter this epigenetics, because of that, we understand much more of ourselves. We always ran around thinking, God, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? You know, you've heard this before, too. You know, it's not what's wrong with me. It's what happened to me. That's it. Intergenerational trauma is trauma not resolved, internalized and passed from one generation to another. Eduardo Duran, in his groundbreaking book, Healing the Soul Wound, Counseling with American Indians and Other Native Peoples, he states, and I quote, I have found some research literature emerging from Israeli studies that if trauma is not dealt with in a previous generation, it becomes cumulative, unquote. Therefore, as a result, unresolved trauma becomes more severe each time it is passed on to subsequent generations. <clears throat> I want to tell you why I really believe that this is true, because I have a small um, uh, survey that I did um, After learning a whole, you know, after two years of le learning about ACEs uh, and as being an altar boy, I was an altar boy and I started, I was five years old and I served, I was about 15. And every Saturday, the priest would come and pick us up, some of the boys, and we'd go to the outlying reservations that are more remote and rural. Manzanita, Campo, uh, Sequan, and uh, Hamul. And so we'd go out there and we'd have church, we'd have mass. And then, of course, somebody would die, be dying from those reservations, so then we'd go and have a funeral there. And you all know, you go to a funeral, you know, you pretty much know who died, how they died, how old were they. And after I got a chance to learn more about ACEs, that's when I started to get curious because I felt in my heart that it seemed like a lot of people were young dying. Um, so I went to our graveyard, and I started... Um, writing down all the dates on the tombstones when people were born and when they died. Then I took that information. We didn't start erecting tombstones until 1946. Anyway, when I went home, um, if, if you were a citizen of the country of Haiti, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, your life expectancy is 63. In the United States, men and women, is 79. On my reservation, in the 70 years between 1946 and 2016, the average age of death, 35 miles east of San Diego, in 2016 was 40.7 years of age. 40.7. I was thrilled that my people came to me in the early 1980s to ask me to help them develop an economic base. With the help of my people, we did. So that today we have excellent health insurance. We got excellent recreation programs. 100% uh, of our students have graduated from high school in the last seven years. Not a whole lot are going on to university. That's an issue too, and I think it's related to uh, ACEs. Um, so I figured, what what was the average of death, age of death between the year 2000 and 2016? So the other figure I had was 40.7. In that time period between the year 2000 and 2016, it was 40.5. It went the, 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 we died, we're, we're dying sooner than that. And I was absolutely stunned. I thought, I knew it was gonna be higher, so I just anxiously put that together. I kept checking my figures over and over again. I figured out, hey, you know what? Yeah. So anyway, of course, that's one of the reasons why I'm here, too. These are photographs that were taken around 1900, it appears. And um, we want to go back to those times, but there's no way one can ever go back to the past. But pursuing the values of our ancient ones, singing and dancing as our wisdom keepers once did, Today, we are relearning our language as Indian first speakers. We are beginning to understand by bringing back our cultural identity. We are in pursuit of indigenous wisdom and decolonizing. I personally witnessed how some of our people are changing their lives from addictions to practicing the old ceremonies, and thereby affecting positive changes in their families. And to me, this is evidence-based healing. 
because I've seen it happen over years. I saw those guys come in, start singing and dancing all night at the wakes to pay their respect to people who passed on. And I never saw them drink or drug after that. And then I see them coming in with their kids. Here these kids are 10 years old, 12 years old, 14, and they're staying up all night. I have a lot of respect for those families. The life of our grandmothers and grandfathers we can never go back to. But we can teach values that have sustained us for 10,000 years. There are, there are camps now that anthropologists have looked at that are 34 feet below the topsoil. And so they're saying it's 12, 13,000 years we've been here. And it's, we need to go back, especially to the values of ceremony and generosity. My grandmother told me when I was a child, it's one of the stories I remember, most of them I didn't. I wish I could have, but I didn't because I wasn't paying attention, I guess. But how her grandfather um, would prepare for the hunt. And he would pray the night before. She said that he would ask the deer to give up its life to nourish us. Upon killing the deer, he cut it up and would, saving little for himself, would distribute to those in most need and the elderly. Now that we have a better understanding of epigenetics, our ancestors, warrior spirit, hummingbird, are calling us home. When we get to the front porch of understanding, our healing will be well on its way. This is my great, great grandfather. His name is Muttawir, means hard earth. I kind of look like him, don't I? <laughs> Except for those sports shoes. <laughs> Senor Duro Matawir was a 19th century ch chief who was also a great, great leader. He was a citizen of the Pai Nation of Mesa Grande. He was also a great, great healer. He was wearing a headdress made of owl and hawk feathers. Owl feathers represent someone with wise judgment. Hawk feathers mostly like, most likely red-tailed hawk, which are very sacred to our people. He carries a tin can rattle in his right hand, used as a musical instrument. He must have sung, in our language, lightning songs or shaluk. The, the tin can rattle is a dead giveaway. Those songs are very old and sacred because they reveal how God collected the lightning and how God gave to the dreamer. The dreamer was the first person that ever sang these songs, um, those lightning songs, and that tell the journey to obtain lightning and the eventual death of the God, known as Wonder Boy. Wonder Boy, when Wonder Boy died, the dreamer dug a cremation, crematorium of four feet wide, about eight feet long, and about 24 inches deep. The dreamer cremated Wonder Boy, and today, the Quichan Nation of Yuma, Arizona, and the Kokopa near Summerton, Arizona, still cremate their dead in exactly the same way. Uh, the Kumeyaay did also, but the influence of Catholics, we had to stop doing that. But now it's starting again. Matter of fact, we uh, had a cremation for one of our chiefs, Leroy Elliott, a very good friend of mine. And at first, the authorities said we couldn't do it, so we said, hey, this is about religion. And so they backed off. Mr. Robert Escalante, my mentor, was teaching me these songs. Unfortunately, he died on Christmas Eve in 1991. I will sing you a few notes of one of probably 100 shaluks or lightning songs. And I'm asking my great-great-grandfather, Muttawir, to sing to you through me. You hawada me, you, you hawada me, you kaku, awada me, you, you awada me, you, you awada me, you kaku, awada me, you, you wada me, you kaku, awada me, you kaku, awada me, you, you a yami kai now, you a yami kai now kaku, a yami kai now. You yami kai now kaku, a yami kai now kaku, a yami kai now. Hmm, 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 hmm. 
And the reason why we do that at the end of the song is scared the coyote away because in the beginning, in the beginning, uh, we had a God who died and the people were all gathering around because they were cremating the God. And we were transitioning at that time between humans and animals. Some people were standing there and they had deer antlers. Some were standing there and they had a little bit of fur on them and they had uh, the bear like bear claws, and bear feet. So the coyote kept going around and around and around. Finally, he saw the badger because the badger was short. He jumps over the badger into the crematorium and stole the God's heart. So our people said, now today when you go look at a coyote, his mouth is black inside from the soot. And um, so we still do that same ceremony at our wakes. At midnight, everybody gets up uh, and we all sing in the, the family and the singers, they dance around the casket. And then at six o'clock in the morning also, I'm going to reveal my life that is not unusual among my peers on the reservation. Of course, most of them are dead now. Actually, I'm the oldest male since my uncle died. I'm the oldest male on the reservation. I asked him the other day when I pulled up tribal office. I said, you know what you guys need to do? Talking to tribal council, right? Because I was, I was on a tribal council for 26 years. So you guys need to issue me a uh, handicapped parking space, because I come here a lot, and I want to, be, I want to get close. Oh, yeah, we'll do that. Said, <laughs> so I'll go to continue with the definitions here. The definition of warrior is not one who solely participates in war. A warrior is a man or a woman who is honest and seeks justice. A warrior is someone who is polite and courteous. A warrior is courageous and will rise up above others who are afraid to act. A warrior is honorable in all things, and a warrior is a person of compassion. A warrior has sincerity, and when it says that he's going to perform and do something, it's as good as done. A warrior is someone who is bound to duty and loyalty. He or she is immensely loyal to those of their, in their care. If need be, a, a warrior will act to protect others, and that's indigenous wisdom. We who work in Indian country to heal from historical and childhood trauma have been made aware by our elders. We have a warrior who will help us journey into darkness to help our people heal. And those of you who have worked with people who have suffered tremendous childhood trauma, you know how difficult that is. You know, it can be dangerous. Our elders advise us that the warrior spirit is, living, is a living, vibrant being that has been present in Indian country for thousands of years and is the force, the healing power, and the essence and the foundation that the Creator gave to Native Americans to heal. The warrior spirit must be recognized to provide holistic healing for our population. One who invites the warrior spirit into their hearts to heal invites the divine as one invites a holy entity. Indigenous wisdom is practically everything that colonialization is not. It wasn't greed. It wasn't an agenda of my, me, mine, or I. It certainly wasn't me first at the expense of you. It wasn't the accumulation of personal wealth. It wasn't intolerance because you believe different from another. Indigenous wisdom is what did our ancestors do to prevail that caused us to prevail for thousands and thousands of years before European contact? It was the supremacy of our creator that gave us all things to understand our creator's love for us. The air that we breathe. How many times we get up in the morning and are grateful for the air by being able to take a breath? The water we drink, the plant life, the animals that give up themselves to nourish us to do good. Indigenous, indigenous wisdom tells us that the animal should guide the people, show them the proper way. The animal guides creator gave our fathers and our fathers gave them to us. Indigenous wisdom gave us ceremony that bring wisdom to allow us to help heal each other. Our intuition tells us to consistently do the right thing for others, especially those in most need. Indigenous wisdom tells us to honor the six directions the great mystery has given to us. The six directions to the east, where Eagle comes to us, where Grandfather Fire rises every day. Eagle, teach us to fly wingtip to wingtip with you so that we can see more clearly our obligations to each other during our healing journey. To the south, 
where Rattlesnake comes to us with healing from historical and childhood trauma. Rattlesnake help us to shed all fears the way you shed your skin. To the west where ancient wildcat comes to us, where grandfather fire, the sun, rests on sacred mountain before the long journey that's gonna to bring tomorrow. Wildcat, you who bring new life from within, continue to help bring life and enjoyment for tomorrow in our new life of healing. To the north where hummingbird comes to us, a small hummingbird, its wings beat 53 times a second and travels 1,300 miles without a rest. Hummingbird brings our ancient ones to us. Let them warm their hands by our fire and let them bring their wisdom to teach us how to heal from trauma. Hummingbird, teach us courage, endurance, and perseverance as you so boldly act year after year, flying from Canada to Argentina and back again. To the earth where our mother is. You who provide all of our relations, the wing, the fur, the, the fin, the creepy crawler, the four-legged, the two-legged. Teach me to come to you when I'm discouraged. Enhance my will to make you well. Dear Mother Earth, help me to find warrior spirit. To the sky where you dwell, O creator, great mystery. You who are known in Kumyai as a Mayacha, you who are known as God, Yahweh, Brahman, Allah, Jehovah, you who are known by a thousand names, and you who are the unnameable one, creator of the star nations, help us bring harmony and goodwill. Help us heal from, from our trauma so that we can help others do the same. I'm going to put colonialization and historical trauma almost in the same sentence. In my opinion, one does not exist without the other. Colonialization has caused Native Americans to move away from original thinking and practices. Generosity, sharing with each other, ex accepting diversity among our people, having profound respect for Mother Earth, it's being truthful. It's the value of the people first. What it, that means is significant, less emphasis on the individual. It's not the accumulation of personal wealth. It's not me, mine, or I, it is us it is we and it's our. It's independence, it's governing ourselves, it's creating harmony among our people. The result of colonialization is internal violence, aggression, and hatred towards oneself, each other, family, community. Native America on reservations has the worst of all human statistics in this country. This includes rapes, murder, assault, sexual abuse of children, suicide, addiction. Then there's present trauma that we all know as adverse childhood experiences. There's another category under present trauma that terrorizes Native America. This is the federal lawmakers attempting to pass laws to place tribal governments in categories of corporations or associations. Marshall knows they've done it several times. Our president recently made a statement that Native America is a race of people. We differ. This was an attempt to eliminate the sovereign rights of tribal governments. A question asked by the average citizen is, why do you folks have sovereign status? Article 1, Section 8, under the Commerce Clause, that states that Congress shall have the power, and I quote, to regulate foreign commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with Indian tribes, unquote determining that Indian tribes are separate from the federal government, the states, and foreign nations. The conjunction and between several, excuse me, between the several states and Indian tribes means the tribal governments and the state governments are equal. Indians hold the United States Constitution as sacred. This is uh, when I was two years old, I think I was two. Something really, you know, I'm gonna, I'll just, I wasn't going to mention it, but I will now. I didn't start walking until I was two years old. And my aunt told me it's because all the young girls wanted to carry me around. <laughs> but you know something? That helped me in my resilience uh, as an adult. I didn't, didn't know it then, even when my aunt told me. But later on, learning about ACEs, I, and anyway, that's my stepfather, 
Uh, on the left is a World War II veteran and my mother. Um, but before I go any further, um, you need to know that I'm not coming entirely from the reference of someone who only academically understands historical and childhood trauma. I've lived it from birth to grade school and as a young adult exposed to war. I remember little of my childhood because of childhood amnesia. And I understand this failure of memory is the result of these traumatic events in my life. As an adult, my relatives told me that my stepfather was mean to me. I don't remember. I do remember he favored his biological son, who I loved dearly. I felt distant from my stepfather, but I felt close to my mother. She treated me with tender affection. Later in my presentation, I will comment why affection is so important. This is, <laughs> this is three photos of me. The one on the left is when I was in the first grade. The one in the center, I, thought I, was in, I was seven years old. I remember trying to, I remember this photograph. I was trying to get up those stairs past that lady but they were telling me that it was dangerous up there. But anyway, I kept trying and trying, and then I couldn't. So I think that look is the look of frustration there. <laughs> and the photo on the right is when I was 12 years old. When I was in the first grade and took this picture, uh, I never, nobody ever told me to smile like when I didn't feel like smiling. I remember standing in line with the other kids, and so I was practicing my smile. I was <laughs> just practicing it. And practicing. You know, so I could break that camera when I got in front of it. Well, now that I look at it, it looks, <laughs> it looks like a smirk. Huh? <laughs> well, anyway, both my parents were binge alcoholics and at times habitual. I did poorly in school, consistently bringing home D's and F's. And my parents divorced when I was in the seventh grade. My mother's alcoholism became chronic, and as a result, my brothers and sisters and I were separated and went to live with different relatives. I still remember vividly when my aunt and uncle came to pick me up at our terribly dilapidated home. The house was falling apart due to neglect and poverty. I was ashamed of my home. I hated it when the school bus stopped to pick me up for school. As I got a little older, I got up early and walked and catch the bus at another bus, bus stop far from my home. The photo on the right is about the early 1950s. So my Uncle Tom and my Aunt Mary, those are the people who raised me the second half of my freshman year in high school. And the house behind them uh, is where I lived with, with them. Um, my Uncle Tom, <laughs> this photo on the left is, um, is myself and my Uncle Tom. We were at a, at a formal event. He didn't want to go. He said, come on, Uncle Tom. I said, you make us do these things all the time. I think I kind of shamed him out because he, he did go and he had a great time. I went to live with my aunt and uncle the second semester of my freshman year in high, of high school. They were fluent Kumeyaay speakers. Both were masters of nonverbal communication. And I learned after I got older that almost all those people were like that. They were highly observant to detail. They had a great and wonderful and considerable sense of humor. They, they valued hard work, honesty, accountability, respect, fairness, community service, and generosity. And these are old Indian values that I now understand as indigenous wisdom. My uncle served on the BS Tribal Council for more than 50 consecutive years, unheard of in Indian country today. I stayed in remedial classes until my sophomore year in high school. And in the 10th grade, I had perfect attendance and was moved out of remedial classes. In high school, I went to summer school every year. I would ride with my uncle every morning when he went to work. Uh, he would drop me off about four miles from school. And summer school let out early in the early afternoon, so I would hitchhike home every day about 12 miles. My aunt and uncle were very pro-education. I was highly motivated to get the best education that I could. This motivation came from my aunt and uncle. Upon graduating from high school, I was awarded two small scholarships to attend community college. I wasn't even going to go. My uncle told me I better go. And I understood later that no Indian from my res ever attended college until, um, until I went. If not for them, 
my aunt and uncle, I have no doubt I would have been dead or locked away in prison long ago. I thrived under their roof. The photo on the left is me when I was about nine years old on a horse Comanche. In some of these photographs, you're gonna see me with a cowboy hat. I'm not a cowboy, and nor do I ever walk around with a cowboy hat. I just did that because we were going to a party or something. But, <laughs> yeah. And, um, and that's the way it was with all the guys on the reservation. A lot of them were cowboys. I mean, like real working cowboys. But you never see them wear boots, never see them wear a cowboy hat. Until they were gonna go ride a horse. And they would because it's a matter of safety. Um, I was quite a horseman back then. This is my brother, Linky, his Lynx or Linky. Um, he was killed in an automobile accident at 13 years old. The photo on the right is my best friend in the whole world. Um, my first cousin, Harold Satch Christman. He was about 12 years old then. And uh, uh, right now his son is the tribal chairman of our reservation. Historical trauma was imposed on me at a very young age. Starting in school in 1952 in, the Alpi in Alpine, California, near San Diego, one of my earliest school memories was noticing different restrooms for Indian children and non-Indian children. There was one black family in the school district, and the children from that family used the white kids' restroom and drinking fountains. I never went into the white kids' restroom out of fear. My cousin did. She said the white kids' restroom was filthy. She said the, the Indians took care of their restroom and kept it clean. Uh, she was, she was light-complected, so she used both. No matter what the occasion, the Indian kids had to line up at the end of the line after the white kids. Uh, first of all, there was Indian girls first and Indian boys last. After the first grade, the kids were segregated into two kinds of classes, the smart kids in one class and the dumb kids in the other class, and that's how we used the term. We were the dumb kids. Um, Indians were always in the dumb kids' class. I had a cousin who was promoted uh, from the second grade to the fourth grade, he refused to go because he didn't want to leave his cousins. Another Indian were in his class. I always felt inferior uh, in public school. I felt I didn't belong. I certainly felt I wasn't very smart. I never studied. My mother told me that one day I came home from school in the first grade, and I was very excited and absolutely overjoyed and exclaimed that, Mama, Mama, guess what? I'm no longer the dumbest kid in class. David Beaches. And now I'm second to the dumbest. I remember saying that. Even when I knew that if there was a pony poop in the barn, I knew that there was a pony for me. Even then, resilience and indigenous wisdom was on this red man's trail. I believe it was the affection of my mother that caused this resilience. It wasn't until the eighth grade that an Indian kid moved to a class with the smart kids. She never graduated from high school. It was my first cousin, Catherine Hyde. She died of alcoholism at 30 years of age. I'll add that I failed public school miserably, but I excelled in catechism on the reservation. I always brought home the best deportment and achievement Later, when I was a teenager living with my aunt and uncle, I taught catechism to the younger kids. This slide, left to right, is my brother Rocky. Rocky was very kind. He was empathetic. He was sensitive to the feelings of others. He was a forgiving person who spent his free time helping other people. This photo here, Rocky is 20 years old, and he committed suicide at 21. The middle photo is my brother, Tarsi. He's 16 years old in this photo. And he died in an automobile accident when he was 17. I felt a special closeness to my brother, Tarsi. The young 16-year-old on the right, my brother, Tarsi, was, and I believe, exceptional. He and I really connected. Tarsi was exceptionally bright, sensitive, and he was already on his way to being a great warrior. In his, in his early age, he understood before any of us the challenges of colonization, and he was already on his journey to decolonize, the journey many of us are on today. The photo on the right is my brother, Linky. 
I was closest to him. He was 17 months younger than I was. Because we were closer to age, we did everything together. When our parents divorced, Linky re rebelled in ways quite unusual. At 12 years old, he would not obey his parents, our parents. He became independent. He owned his own car at 12 years old. He owned a horse. Uh, he purchased a shotgun and a 22 caliber rifle. He already owned cattle. And he would pay someone to take the cattle to market. He was killed in an automobile accident at 13. I have a deep love for my little brothers. One never gets over losses like this, personally, nor do I even want to. The pain is a healing journey that never concludes. It helps build wisdom and resilience. This is the photo on the left is my former wife, Jeannie, and our godchildren. Uh, the little girl on the left is Olitha Leo, and she's here with us today. Um, I'm so glad I get a chance to serve with her. It's, just, it's special. Uh, and the middle child is Amber Lachapa. It was Amber's birthday. And the, the child on the right is my son, John Elliott. Um, Amber died of addictions, complications of addictions at 34 years old. The photo on the right is my son, John and me in the middle, and my son Tommy on the right. This was Thanksgiving 2018, the past Thanksgiving. Um, John Eagle Spirit Elliott, who has served on the management of Band of Kumeyaay Tribal Council for 18 years. He is the leader of a cultural renaissance. Manzanita has and is the cultural leader among the youth and Kumeyaay people. The far right is my son Tommy Pico. He's an accomplished author. He just completed his fourth book on poetry. He said he was, that was his final one. He's now writing movie scripts in Seattle, San Francisco, and here in Los Angeles. Uh, two years ago, he won the prestigious Whiting Award for Literature that came with a $50,000 first prize. Being with my two sons is the most precious time of my whole life. I just lived for that time. They're the nicest men I ever met. Next photo is an Army photo when I was in training. Um, I was drafted into the military and serving in Vietnam as an Army paratrooper in the infantry. I spent a great deal of time in the jungle. Re returning home, I was a different person. I was suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, and I didn't know it. I also believe my childhood trauma resurfaced because of my war experience. I became an alcoholic and a drug addict, trying to quell the demons of the war and my childhood. My time in Vietnam was the most profound period of my entire life. I measure every day by my experience there. Every day that goes by, I don't remember, excuse me, every day that goes by, uh, I remember my 13 friends whose names are etched on the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Every day that goes by, to me, is like a walk in the park. In the early 1980s, at 38 years of age, I was asked by my elders to run for the office of chairman. They wanted me to help them establish an economic base. I had the privilege of serving my people for 26 years. The photo on the right is the Honorable Leroy Elliott. He's chairman of the Manzanita Band of Kumeyaay Indians. And Leroy taught me and gave me the most precious gift that anybody could, could. He taught me how to sing bird songs. And that is indigenous wisdom. This is a photo of my wife, Diana. We attended many functions promoting our VS community when I was chairman. Diana is a retired registered nurse. And for the last 20 years, she's been studying alternative medicine. In addition, she has studied traditional medicine practices from the Caro tribe of Peru uh, and the Huiraca from the interior of Mexico, who are part of the Huicholi Nation. Uh, I now, 
I know that she would not want me to say this, um, but she's an accomplished healer. Much of the apprenticeship that she went under, under was spent in prayer, which heightens intuition. Sometimes her intuition is way off the charts, and that's when she gets a little too spooky for me. <laughs> really. Don't ask me any questions, Diana, please. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the guy in the middle with a gourd rattle. That's Dr. Ron Chrisman. He's my next door neighbor. Uh, he has a doctor of, uh, of humane letters from uh, United, University of California, San Diego. To his, to the, the left on this photo, uh, his son, Ralph Crispin, and myself. Indigenous wisdom carries our generations through our cultural traditions. Whenever we celebrate, we sing and dance. Whenever we mourn, we sing and dance. I was told that our people used to sing and dance all the time. Individuals had their own songs that they composed. Families had their own songs that they composed. Villages had their own songs, and the nation had their own songs, in addition to eagle songs, salt songs. Um, and those ceremonies, sometimes the creation story would last four days. So, and they were able to take a lot of that time singing and dancing, and sometimes having fun, I'm sure, because they were able to manip manipulate the environment in Southern California to provide more food for the animals, and more animals than was more food for people. And this was the second most populated area outside of Mexico City in Aboriginal times. They were smart people. Uh, this is when I, I spent a lot of time in Washington, D.C. when I was the chairman, mostly about the gaming issues. Um, but here on the left, I was at the Capitol, we're talking about Native Americans' right to govern themselves. The middle photograph was at the National Press Club, and the one on the right, I was uh, addressing the uh, National Congress of American Indians. During the time I was chairman, I had to go in front of my people at a general meeting. That's when everybody gets together once a month. Everybody grinds their axes. Indians are hard on their leaders. And announced that I was checking myself into an alcoholic and drug treatment program. The second time was the hardest thing I ever did. I thought I should tell them before they found out. I thought they'd be surprised. They, were, they already knew. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They told me to go get well and hurry back. They said there was still much to do and they needed me. And over the years, I admitted myself into alcohol and drug treatment programs seven times, seven different times. This photo here um, was when we won Proposition 5, which was an Indian self-reliance uh, for state proposition. And the California Supreme Court declared that that was unconstitutional, so we had to do it again at the next uh, uh, cycle, election cycle, and that's where we introduced Proposition 1A to amend the state's constitution to allow gaming on Indian reservations only. That won by 69%. I would be remiss if I did not express my profound gratitude to the voting citizens of California that approved Proposition 1A that amended the California constitution to allow slot machines on tribal lands to tribal governments. And that was in March of 2000. The gaming revenues has helped tribes strengthen their tribal governments, build badly needed infrastructure, revitalize our Indian culture and language, diversify our tribal government's economy to provide thousands of jobs for not only for Native citizens, but for others with real upward mobility and benefits, to educate our children, provide university scholarships to protecting the environment of Mother Earth in helping reverse global warming revenue for the tribes who are not in, we gave revenue for the tribes who are not involved in gaming. And that came from viejas. I was telling the other leaders, we're looking for trouble if we have a society of haves and have nots. So the ones that are not in gaming, I think they get about $1.1 million a year. Proposition 5 and 1A became the most expensive propositions in the state, in the California state history, well over $200 million for both of them. California tribes paid a steep price learning to play the political game. Now we are experts. Thank you. Yes.
making it, I could tell you a lot of stories about that too. And, but better to hold them back in case we've got to do it again. Okay, making and keeping political friends is the next slide here. You probably recognize some of these people. Uh, along the way to self-reliance, we made and continue to make friends. Money is very hard to make when you start at zero. It's a grinding, grinding journey. But I'm here to tell you what you probably already know, but we didn't know it at the time. But making money is even, keeping money is even more difficult than making it. We continue to foster stakeholders within our enterprises and maintaining political support through supportive lawmakers who believe we have the right to govern ourselves, which is our sovereignty. This is a photograph of my dear mother. Um, she stayed clean and sober, I think, the last 25 years of her life. I'm so proud of her. She has so much courage. Um, she hosted hundreds of nights in, at her, in her home as we sang bird songs, practicing them, learning to bring back our songs that have sustained us for thousands of years. This is indigenous wisdom. She died a few years after this photo was taken. My life has been has not been an easy one. It's been filled with profound sadness and absolute joy. Failure and great success, apathy and visionary purpose, utter despair and considerable hope. It hasn't been easy, but because of my mother's affection, because I grew up in a cohesive tribal and unified native community, and the fact that my aunt and uncle accepted me unconditionally, all the while mentoring me by example, I became resilient because they were people I could trust I became resilient because of my mother's affection I became resilient that resiliency is the result of unconditional acceptance I knew I mattered to my mother to my aunt and uncle and to my tribal community I cannot overemphasize the importance of affection by a mother no matter how much I was disappointed in my mother, I always knew that she loved me. Trust in parents or primary caregivers for us is so important, at least it was for me, because when they pass on lessons, we believe and trust their wisdom and life experience. Everything my aunt and uncle taught me, especially through our native traditions, has been the foundation of who I am today. My uncle, through example, taught me traditional tribal leadership that I know is indigenous wisdom. This allowed me to be a person of leadership for 26 years. Indigenous wisdom in leadership is first and foremost, develop compassion and empathy for your people. Understand and practice humility. Remember you are a servant of the people. Be well versed on the pain and suffering of your people. Know what you don't know. Be a good listener by hearing with your heart. Do not use fear of not being reelected as a condition of decision making. Pursue a spiritual awakening. Understand the health and safety of your people is the priority. Be unfailingly polite. Do the best that you can to admit your mistakes because to err is human. Find someone to mentor you. Be clean and sober. I always give credit to others. Always give credit to others. As my uncle told me, he said, if there's anything that is of outstanding accomplishment, he said, others will say it for you. You don't have to say anything. Don't brag or embellish. It can cause jealousy and make your leadership responsibilities more difficult. These are indigenous values to strive for. Obviously, I didn't always live up to them myself. Warrior spirit, healing historical trauma. Indigenous practices developed over thousands of years and represent the presence and the power to address trauma and bring to individuals, families, and communities. And I'll share this story with you um, because I was asked to, but I had heart palpitation. So I had to go to the hospital and they were gonna do the shock and get them back into rhythm. And so they had to go under anesthesia. So I was laying on the gurney, he gave me the shot, told me to start counting. I don't know, I must have made it one, two or something, that's about it. And then I remember that there was a whole bunch of people around my bed with dark faces, and I knew they were my people. 
around the bed. I, you know what, I'm gonna tell you, I said, I said this earlier at lunch. I've never, never, ever experienced any kind of vision. You know, you see it in the movies and all that stuff, you know. I heard a guy say one time he was in a sweat lodge and his eagle was going round and round inside, you know. I should have drug tested him before he went in. But, but anyway, I've never had anything even close to that. And so they started singing. They were singing to me. And um, they asked me to sing with them, but they didn't talk. I just kind of knew it, but they did say that. So I started singing with them. Then they left, and then guess what? God got there. Holy mackerel, just like in the movies. God got there, and uh, he told me to continue this journey of heal helping to heal um, historical and childhood trauma. And he told me, he says, you will live to be 92. I know what God meant. He meant, Anthony, you take care of yourself, you live to be 92. That's what he's saying. I can interpret God, too, just like some of those evangelists on TV. So I went and asked all my, I asked uh, these people who do sing a lot of songs too, a lot of them are older. Um, and I sang the song to them and I said, do you know the song? Have you heard about the song? You know, and I said, no, they didn't. So I had a friend of mine who's Kokopa from Summerton, Arizona. And he's good friends with the, with the um, Kuchan of Yuma, Arizona. And, and so, I sang the song to him for a few times, he got it, so he happened to be going back, and I asked the old people there what they sing. And same, same, they didn't know what it meant. Uh, and certainly, you know, I don't know if they've heard it before, but anyway, it was probably sung in a different language. Because our language, the language I'm talking right now is gonna evolve, you know, 5,000 years from now, when it sounds the same, probably nobody will understand me. Because the words change, will change as we evolve along. But the song goes like this. Thon, thon, nigh your way, a will we on. Thon, thon, nigh your way, nigh your way, a will we on. A thon, thon, nigh your way, a will we on. Thon, thon, nigh your way, nigh your way, a will we on. A thon, thon, nigh your way, a will we on. Thon, thon, nigh your way, nigh your way, a will we on. Nigh your way. Nigh away, nigh away, nigh away, or will we own? Thong thong, nigh away, nigh away, or will we own? A thong thong, nigh away, or will we own? Thong thong, nigh away, nigh away, or will we own? A thong thong, nigh away, or will we own? Nigh away, nigh away, nigh away, nigh away, or will we own? Thong thong, nigh away, nigh away, or will we own? Yeah! Mm -hmm. If there was any coyotes in the room, they must have took off. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, here we go. One of these days I'll get this. I'll be really in tune to this kind of stuff. Anyway, this is the medicine wheel. And we look at the medicine wheel for mental health. The elders advise in the First Nations study. There's actually a study about this. Um, the integration of indigenous wisdom and Western medicine is reflected on the medicine wheel of, for, for mental health, which the elders advise a First Nation study. The circle of life is reflected through culturally storytelling, sense of belonging and community, and our interconnectivity with all things and our spirituality. Um, these next two, these are research papers that were actually done. Um, about the indigenous approach. And um, these are online. They were uh, within um, uh, yeah, ACES and Native American community. Yeah, so that way, so anyway, I'm gonna kinda go to that. Um, this, these photographs here, these were in Sacaton and um, this was the first Warrior Spirit Gila River Indian Community Conference in April 2018. Warrior Spirit healing historical trauma movement began in the, in the southwestern states, ignited by the synergy of many tribal nations supporting the water protectors of Standing Rock. The movement through indigenous wisdom gains momentum. The first Warrior Spirit was held in April 2018 at the Gila River Indian Community in Sacaton, Arizona and was the first time several tribal nations came together with the intention of healing historical trauma. 
I'm proud to say that the second time several tribal nations came together, uh, our nations was, uh, was, a, was our Southern California Warrior Spirit Conference and Ceremony uh, in San Diego on October 8th to the 10th of last year, calling upon the warrior spirit to heal historical trauma brought together a distinguished group of Native American professionals and elders, uh, Native and ally practitioners and researchers addressing historical trauma uh, from indigenous holistic healing uh, perspectives, bringing together indigenous wisdom with ACEs science, we seek to understand the impacts of historical and childhood trauma. The third Four Corners Warrior Spirit Conference uh, and ceremony is this April 4th and 5th, calling upon the warrior spirit inspired by our creator to heal historical trauma among our Native Americans through historical wisdom, through historical indigenous wisdom, and that'll be in Window Rock, Arizona. And this is the best part for me. Okay, I would like to introduce to you the Southern California Warrior Spirit team I belong to. Uh, there was five of us, and we put on that conference, it was a ma major national conference uh, on Native American trauma in five months. And looking that up, we usually take a paid staff about a year to do that. Uh, man, we, were, <laughs> I, we all worked harder than any of us had ever worked in our lives. One, several days, it was 18 hours. I don't know how many times it was, I finally took off my pajamas and it was like six o'clock in the evening. You know. Um, but I'd like to introduce them. I had the privilege of introducing our chairwoman, Olitha Leo. Where did she go? Oh, there she is over there, yeah. She's my niece and she's my godchild. Olitha is a citizen of the VS Band of Kumeyaay, located 30 miles east of San Diego. She's an activist uh, for social justice and dignity for all people. She's a successful entrepreneur. She is generous, volunteering to serve on the Warrior Spirit Committee, and most importantly, she is a conscientious niece. No, she's, <laughs> <laughs> she's a conscientious parent uh, who understands the importance of indigenous wisdom and one who so gallantly, one of many gallant women uh, who are citizens of the VS Band of Kumeyaay Indians. Tamara Strohauer has worked alongside Native Americans for a better part of 40 years she is the first generation college student, 24 years after graduating from high school. She received a master's in social work with a minor in American Indian Studies in 2016 at San Diego State University, where she lectures. Tamara is immensely popular and loved in San Diego County reservations. Her compassion, love, and empathy for those she served is off the charts. That's why she's loved so much. People know that she's real. She is the Southern Region Project Coordinator of Indigenous Social Workers for Change. As the Project Coordinator, Tama works with 11 Southern California universities and schools of social work. And I think she was at one time a member of the American Indian Movement, so she's a tough one. <laughs> I don't know if they issued her a rifle or not. <laughs> I don't know how many Dana Browns there are, but if you could only see her soul, you would think that there are 100 of her. <laughs> She describes herself as a social entrepreneur. Uh, to give you an idea of her leadership and her integrity, I'll name a few organizations that she either founded or co-founded. She founded the, the Youth Leadership uh, Trauma-Informed Community Schools at Cherokee Point Elementary School in City Heights. She co-founded um, co the Youth Voice and our Students of Leadership Empowerment Service. She founded uh, charter Development Program at Tierra Elementary School. She was a commissioner of the City of San Diego Gang Prevention and Intervention, co-chair of the San Diego Trauma Informed Guide Team, to name a few. She is presently the ACES Science California Statewide Facilitator for, of Learn for Life. She received the President Obama's USA's Volunteer President Award, received Advocacy Award from Mental Health America. Above all, I mean this with all sincerity. Above all and anything else, she is who God meant our human species to be. She is, as the entire team, I have introduced absolutely loving individuals who rely on prayer, not necessarily Christian orientation, 
to guide us in the right way. All I have is my opinion here um, on this issue, but I believe that these people are saints. Um, I proudly hold them uh, in the highest regard. I'm so honored to serve with you guys. This is at the conference that we had in October, the posting of the colors, the flag ceremony. They post the colors before um, the conference and then uh, retreat the colors after the conference. Native Americans are overwhelmingly patriotic to the United States of America. We are the first to join the military in time of conflict. Native Americans have the highest percentage in relation to our population of military service, higher than any group. We're very proud to say that we've been decorated for valor above and beyond the call of duty, racial-wise, more than any other group. This was during the opening prayer of our conference. And through much of our culture, though much of our culture has been lost from genocide and colonialism, we are still steeped in indigenous wisdom, ceremony, and gratitude. We honor our elders. Honoring our wisdom keepers is sacred. Their storytelling for generations has kept our cultural traditions and Native American practices alive. The fellow that you see, his picture is in the middle. And again, he's on the left side because I was interviewing him during the conference. Um, he was orphaned, he, he was 101 years old. He was orphaned at five. He went to an orphanage. And then he left there because he was small and they were picking on him. And so he was bullied, so he left there and rode the rails as a child among the hobos. With them, he learned generosity, he learned independence, he learned compassion, he learned empathy. He learned to be his brother's keeper. He ended up in Nebraska, Boys Town, with Father Flanagan, the greatest of, of life's lessons came from Father Flanagan himself, because Joe wouldn't attend mass. He didn't care for Catholics that much. So Father Flanagan asked Joe, he said, Joe, I'd really appreciate it um, if you went to mass to be an example to the younger boys. Appreciate. Joe never heard those words before, and that caused him to keep those words in his mind and his heart it's still there today. Just somebody told him, you know, I'd appreciate it if you could do it. And nobody ever said that to him before. Um, Joe went on to a naval career as a World War II photographer and eventually at San Diego State University where he developed their school of photography. Joe is a founding board member of the San Diego Indian Center, the San Diego Human Resource uh, Center, and the San Diego Urban Indian Health Medical Services. Joe is an app. I wish he was here. You could see him. The guy acts like he's my age. He does. The way he moves his head, the way his arm gestures. And when we're at a restaurant, when the waitress comes, he stands up to honor her. I mean, if I was that age, I'd probably be home sleeping or something. <laughs> you know. And the photo on the right is Trini Cuero Botello. Uh, where over 300 people honored her that day. And Olitha Leo was the one that made that happen. And it was such a beautiful and heartwarming uh, event there. And Trini died about a month after that photo was taken. We had bird singing at the conference. We had poetry and jingle dance, traditional cultural practice and healing traditions included our bird songs and poetry and storytelling and jingle dance. No, that was, OK. I got strike two on me. OK, anyway, I know about this one. There we go. OK, our keynote speaker was Dr. Vincent Folletti. Uh, he raised awareness and deepened understanding of the impact of genocide and colonialization um, by reflecting on the health, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual of our indigenous families across the lifespan. Of course, Dr. Folletti is the co-principal investigator of adverse childhood experiences. He has been a great friend of Indian country. 
And I'm so glad I got a chance to meet him several times. I even presented with him before. I couldn't believe it. The first time I read about this guy, you know, I, I never believed that I would actually be on the same stage with him. I mean, he just, I wanted to kiss his boots, but he didn't have any boots on. He had shoes on. <laughs> Okay, we had, uh, we had a youth and elder panels every day uh, honoring the storytelling and voice of our elders and youth. The panels throughout the three-day ceremony and conference highlighted uh, indigenous leaders of all ages and they shared their resilience building practices through indigenous wisdom. Crazy Horse's prophecy was highlighted each day of the three-day ceremony. We are the seventh generation. A message of hope, healing, through indigenous wisdom is igniting momentum across this country in the Indian community. And part of Crazy Horse's um, prophecy is, I see a time of seven generations when all colors of mankind will gather under the sacred tree of life and the whole earth will become one circle again. So that's what we're trying to promote. Uh, the people that had a chance to make medicine bags for themselves, uh, where their healing was going to go. Um, talking circles, where people in a circle led by someone who knows how to do that very well. So people could have a chance to tell the truth as they chose to do that. And they went for hours because there were so many people there. Uh, and sweat lodges. And we had sweat lodges for women, sweat lodges for men. Um, the future, indigenous youth leaders through indigenous wisdom, guiding the resilience building pathway ahead of bringing healing with Native Americans and all living things, plant life, animal life, Mother Earth and human beings. At the end of the third day, we had a call to action that people would fill out. Uh, attendees were there, invited them to engage in resilience building movement. We wanted to collect information from those who attended so it would give us guidance on where, are we going to be, where we need to go. And the first question was, what does indigenous wisdom mean to you? The second question was, what do you see as the next step in healing? And the third question was, what practices are you and or your community already using to foster resilience? What that did, we collected the information. And what the people were saying is that we want our youth to be part of this movement. So that's what we're planning on doing. Thank you. Yeah, that's it there, call to action. Okay, and um, so at first we're gonna have the youth that were at the, at the conference together and we're gonna help them identify the indigenous wisdom values uh, and also find out from them what is their vision and anybody else, even in this room, can be part of that movement. But we who are not in that age group, but something like 12 to maybe 30, um, we will be allies, provide for them whatever they need uh, to further their own vision. And so the, our Southern California Warrior Spirit team is moving forward uh, with Olitha Leo, Dana Brown, Tamara Strohauer, and myself. There we are. Please allow me to read a poem to you. Inspired in the content of this poem uh, by a fluent Kumyai speaker, Debbie Stein, who is not Kumyai. She is Inuit, she's from Nunavut, which is now ca uh, Canada. She is teaching a whole generation of Kumeyaay children who are English first speakers to speak Kumeyaay. And Debbie said, and I quote, I began to learn the Kumeyaay language. I began to hear with my heart. Kumeyaay is a heart-based language, unquote. That statement echoing in my heart is the inspiration for this poem. My inspiration also comes from uh, a Navajo elder, Kenneth G. White Jr., who introduced me to the warrior spirit, the title of this poem. I'm going to preface, preface this uh, by introducing you to Ishi. Some of you, because you're from California, you may know who he is. Uh, 
who this poem is about. He was the last known citizen of the Yahi Nation, whose estimated number was between 1,500 and 3,000 uh, citizens in the rich Northern California foothills of Mount Lassen. Ishii's people were exterminated during the California genocide between 1846 and 1873. Ishii was born in 1862 at the height of the indiscriminate, brutal, violent, merciless slaughters of every man, woman, and child that could be found. The, the, the Yahi never possessed guns. They were outnumbered, outgunned, and hated, like all California Indians at that time. The last 10 years of their existence, they were, they, where they lived, were outlawed on their own land during the era known as concealment. During that time, Yahi citizens and honorable people were reduced to living in impenetrable places where no one could or would go and steal whatever they could just to eat. Warrior spirit. I am warrior spirit. My language has taught me to hear with my heart. I hear the chuckle of the stream next to my home. This is how our creator speaks to me. I hear the laughter of the birds. I hear the delight of my, vill at my village as my mother, my father, my little brother, sister sing to my little nephew. I hear the beautiful melody of the breeze that blows through the oak trees. I hear the caution of my elders as we hurry to carry our village higher into the mountains. Why is everybody so afraid? I now hear the laborious breathing of my wounded father and mother embracing half of my little nephew. I am Ishii, warrior spirit. My language has taught me to see with my heart. I see the beauty of the world, our land, and all the gifts that the Creator has given us to enjoy. I see my people starving the little children starving. I see the ribs of my little brother. When we go out to hunt, our hunters often don't return. I see them hanging from a tree or lying in the hot summer sun, bloated, grotesque, and malformed. I am Ishii, warrior spirit. My language has taught me to touch with my heart. I touch the nose of a fawn. She knows we are relatives. I touch the spirit of all who have come before me, and I touch the spirit of the rainbow people who come after me. I touch the sky and the earth. I am related to the star nations and all the stone people. We are one. I touch the quivering lips of my little brother as we hide in the dark thicket as shaggy men go by with crack guns looking for the vulnerable. I touch the skin of my little obligation in the safety of darkness as he lay on my bare chest his unrest quivering while he sleeps. I am Ishii, warrior spirit. My language has taught me to taste with my heart. I now taste the anxiety, the uncertainty, the agony, and the fear of concealment that leads and follows me everywhere. I taste the tears running down my face. I've lost my little brother. I hid him so I can go find food. I can't call for him. I search through my panic, I searched through my dread. I searched through my distress. I searched through my confusion. I searched through my weariness. I searched through my exhaustion. I searched through my horror. I search, I search, I search, 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 search. I now taste the deformed, the distorted, the disjointed that is, that is mangled by only a 56 caliber Spencer rifle can inflict. I am Ishii warrior spirit. My language has taught me to smell with my heart. I now smell stench everywhere. No relief until the wind blows. I smell old stench, which I recognize as miles away. It draws me to its calamity, the sight of grievous affliction. I find old, rotten bodies, unrecognized human forms who must be my relatives, contorted in death. Oh, no. Oh, no. One is my sister. I am so hungry, malnourished. I now smell death. I am alone. I am abandoned. I'm exhausted physically, mentally, emotionally. But like the warrior spirit, I never give up. 
Even though I am thoroughly spent, my spirit is revitalized. I am warrior spirit. I am warrior spirit. My spirit no longer lives where I was born. I am now with you when you need me. I'm now with you when you're hurt, when you're healing, with your healing journey, when you call for me. I am now with you in your pain and when you cry. I come to you when you ask. I am with you when you create sacred space. I am with you when you create ceremony. When you are afraid, remember me. I am Ishii, warrior spirit. I come into every heart when asked, inspired by our creator. I now ask for a moment of silence for all people who have suffered genocide. I'm going to read an excerpt from the book Murder State, California's Native American Genocide, 1846-1873, by Brandon C. Lindsay. And I quote, in the second half of the 19th century, the Euro-American citizenry of California carried out mass genocide against the Native population of their state, using the processes and mechanism of democracy to secure land and resources for themselves and their private interests, murder, rape, and enslavement of thousands of Native people were legitimized by notions of democracy, in this case, mob rule, through a discreetly organized and brutally effective series of petitions, referenda, town hall meetings, and votes at every level of California government. It would not hurt for most of us to be reminded that rhetoric of freedom, liberty, and democracy had been put to terrible use in the past and can be so again. In 19th century California, many settlers needed only hubris and self-interest to kill Indians. For them, organized government and its accoutrements cost too much money and took too much time to deliver on their demands. Average white citizens in California could dispose of Native American people on their own and simply send the bill to the government for reimbursement. Self-described, hardworking, self-sufficient, entrepreneurial citizens claimed they were doing their pragmatic best to bring peace, law, and order in the name of democracy, progress, and the fulfillment of manifest destiny by killing or relocating uncivilized savages in California. Indeed, democracy as a political system served as a genocidal mechanism. The will of the white majority, enshrined as the secret will of the people, drove the democratic process of creating a multifaceted campaign of genocide in California. Native people were starved to death, worked to death, shot to death, or so badly broken by poverty, exposure, and malnutrition as to waste away from disease at an alarming rate Representatives were elected, laws enacted, meetings held, and companies of volunteers empowered, all in the name of legally removing or exterminating Native peoples in the state. What one might describe, as the fellow said earlier in the video, as an appalling crime today was in the 19th century typically legal, or at least not illegal enough to bring widespread censure or prosecution for the perpetrators. How could it? When well, the majority of white settlers in California either promoted or supported directly by participation or indirectly by apathy, the horrendous campaign and its outcomes? Many tens of thousands of Native Americans perished in this genocide. The tenacity of California indigenous population outlasted attempts to exterminate them, which has now allowed a recent revitalization, unquote. In the beautiful, ornate Oak Ballroom at Jayhas Indian Reservations Casino and Resort, I ended by proclaiming with outstretched arms, 
Ladies and gentlemen, you are now sitting in this revitalization. In conclusion, our encounter here today with ECHO fills me with hope because of the excellent work that you have been doing, bringing healing modalities to the forefront, the fact that you are so steeped in science. I am filled with anticipation because of the possibilities that lay ahead. I am filled with excitement because I see and, and address of historical and childhood trauma scientifically, spiritually, and holistically. Our encounter these two days is monumental and profound for us. I believe for Native America, this conference offers the best opportunity to blend the science of healing trauma coupled with Native American healing practices that include for us indigenous wisdom and the warrior spirit. Our patron saint, of historical and childhood trauma. The opportunity for the blending of science, scientific and spiritual is what Native America is envisioning. The gift box of holistic healing model has not been opened. I would love to see us who are, he who are on a healing journey to pay it forward. As we minister to those who still suffer this would certainly bring more of the suffering to an end. Let Native America and non-Indians join arms, walk abreast in lockstep unity into the sunrise and the sunset, confident in trust of each other, confident that victory is on our trail, confident that the healing modalities gifted to us by science, the great mystery and warrior spirit will empower us with the vision that our path is not only our path, but a pathway for the world to follow.